My name is Nelson DeMille. I became interested in the history of military aviation when I first flew into battle in Vietnam aboard Army Huey Choppers. And as an author, I have researched many areas of this fascinating subject, which have become part of my best-selling novels. I am proud to present this extensive video, History of Air Combat, produced in commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the United States Air Force. The U.S. Air Force came into being after World War II at the start of the Cold War. This dramatic series features authentic film footage documenting not only today's Air Force, but the early years going all the way back through two world wars to the very birth of powered flight at Kitty Hawk in 1903. While this series is dedicated to the U.S. Air Force, we will also cover the great contributions of the U.S. Army and Navy Air Services. This action-packed series is presented to you in an easy-to-watch video magazine format, which enhances and varies the styles and method of presentation of the different episodes. As you join me in this exciting series, you will note that while most of our scenes are sharp and clear, there may be a few that would not ordinarily meet our standards. However, keep in mind that some of these historic films reach back to the Wright brothers and the First World War from 1914 to 1918. Others were filmed by combat cameramen under battle conditions and in every kind of weather. Also, some contain rare footage or are one of a kind and never before released for public viewing. Some are scenes from gun cameras synchronized with a fighter plane's machine guns shot in the midst of a raging dogfight, and some are captured enemy films. In this video, War and Career Onto the Aloe, you're about to see the outbreak of the world's first jet war. I feel a strong personal attachment here because very close to where I live on Long Island, the F-84 Thunder Jet was built by the Republic Aircraft Company in Farmingdale, New York. Also, the great Navy carrier launch jet fighter, the F-9F Panther, was built only a few miles away in the Grumman Aircraft Factories at Bethpage. Both jets are combat veterans of the Korean War. Our video, War in Korea, covers events leading to the conflict, the communist invasion of South Korea, and the role of American air power in meeting the Red Challenge. In the headquarters of the United States and Russian Joint Control Commission in Korea, there was a meeting soon after the victory over Japan of officers of the two occupying forces. Japanese troops north of the 38th parallel had surrendered to Russia while south of the parallel, the Japanese had surrendered to the Americans. The atmosphere was deceptively friendly, considering what was going to happen later in Korea. The United States considered the dividing line along the 38th parallel to be only a temporary military convenience, but the Russians had other ideas. After the Japanese surrender, American and Russian soldiers in the area near the parallel could be seen for a short time behaving like buddies. This sort of thing didn't last long because the Russian command was about to turn the dividing line into a part of the Iron Curtain. Two years of effort proved that agreement with Russia on Korea was impossible. In 1947, the United States referred the whole problem to the United Nations. The response to the American action was that the General Assembly established a commission to supervise free elections in all of Korea. But the Russians had no intention of allowing such free elections in North Korea. In South Korea, the people turned out in great numbers when the elections were held in 1948. While Russia was setting up a communist regime in North Korea, these South Koreans were forming a constitutional republic and choosing a president. To this government, the United States soon turned over control of our occupied zone. American forces then began their withdrawal. By the middle of 1949, all had moved out except limited numbers for advice and observation. This meant that the Republic of Korea was going to have only a small army and a native constabulary. Forces sufficient to keep order, but not to defend South Korea against military aggression on a large scale. By the middle of 1950, the North Koreans had a fully trained and equipped army. The Russians had seen to that. The day came when it was revealed what had all along been the communist plan, the invasion and seizure of South Korea. The invasion got underway on the morning of Sunday, June 25th, 1950. 
When they crossed the 38th parallel, the communist forces brought along artillery and tanks that had been supplied months before by the Russians. They began the invasion with eight infantry divisions, three border constabulary brigades, and an armored brigade. The South Koreans fought back for a couple of days, and then their resistance collapsed. When the Soviet began this aggression by proxy, they didn't look for any active intervention by the United States or other nations. That was the Reds' big mistake. From Washington, two days after the invasion began, came President Truman's order that American air and sea forces were to go to the help of South Korea. Aircraft of the United States Far East Air Forces were sent at once to operational bases. the B-29s took off for Okinawa, their base for the strike soon to be made against the North Korean invaders. Several F-80 squadrons in Japan were moved to southern Japanese airfields in order to put them within range of targets in Korea. The original fighter squadron of F-51s was soon ready to go into action from Taegu airfield in South Korea. The conflict had hardly begun before our aircraft turned to the big job of keeping the South Koreans from being overrun and crushed at the very outset of hostilities. The North Korean troops were advancing almost unopposed, so our aircraft went to work on them. First, we put a lot of emphasis on ground support of the badly outnumbered defenders. Within a few days, our F-80s were also going after the enemy's lines of supply. We had to slow up his logistics if we were going to keep the South Koreans from being driven off their peninsula. The F-51s, too, went to work on interdiction targets, as well as doing their share in the close support of ground troops. In fact, all of our aircraft gave a fine demonstration of the versatility of air forces. The thing we had to do was trade space for time and slow up the invading forces enough to allow a buildup of defensive strength. So we went on hitting anything that was carrying or storing communist supplies. By now, less than a week after the war started, our airstrikes went well north of the 38th parallel. smoothly operating supply lines. We took out a lot of the smoothness, and we conducted these operations without effective opposition in the air, because as a first order of priority, our aircraft had destroyed the small but vicious North Korean Air Force. South Koreans needed help on the ground. President Truman acted quickly. On June 30th, he ordered United States Army units into action. So here in Japan, troops of the 24th Division, part of our occupation forces, made ready to be flown to the Korean battle area in Air Force C-54s and C-47s. These were the first flights in what came to be the greatest combat airlift in history. This 
was the 4th of July, and the men of the 24th Division were not celebrating the day in quite the way they had planned. When the men of the 24th Division reached Korea, they were implementing the vote of the UN Security Council, which asked all member nations to help. Eventually, 15 other countries sent ground troops to Korea. But from the beginning, by far the largest share of the military burden was borne by the United States. The 24th Division troops were immediately sent to the battle line, not as a unit, but by the plane load. This was an emergency. The enemy had to be slowed up. Even without any support from the air, the North Koreans were a formidable force, well equipped and by far outnumbering the defenders. Piecemeal, the men of the 24th went up into the crumbling line. The enemy had a lot of firepower. They were a strong force, and the most our ground troops could hope for was a delaying action. Our troops needed close support from the air, and from the beginning, the F-80s and our other aircraft of all types supplied it. It was the only thing that prevented immediate disaster. Still, they came on, those North Koreans with their Russian-built tanks. For our people, there was only one thing to do. Pull back, wait for a build-up, and turn a big part of the immediate operation over to our air forces. At best, it was going to be tough to keep a foothold on the peninsula. So, our air forces became the only effective offensive weapon we had in this early phase of the war. For weeks, the chief emphasis was on close support of ground forces. Even the B-29s shared in this job, a new one for these big bombers. The rules had to be forgotten if the North Korean army was to be held at all. The versatility of air forces was proved as never before. When the war was about a month old, we could divert the B-29s and other aircraft to more interdiction raids to keep the enemy's supply routes under attack. By this time, we were beginning to take care of the limited number of strategic targets in North Korea. We were doing a good job in slowing up the enemy's progress southward by destroying today the supplies he had counted on using tomorrow. But it remained true for about six weeks that a major part of our air effort was still in close support. Our B-29s included two strategic air command wings that left the United States soon after the conflict began and were flying combat missions only nine days later, adding their bombing strength to that of our Far East Air Forces. There had been thorough mobility planning for just such an emergency. In mid-August 1950, a month and a half after the invasion began, the famous Pusan perimeter was established. The big withdrawal was over. This far and no farther. The UN ground troops began digging in. The enemy had come far and fast, but now he was running out of steam and was soon going to find things a lot tougher. During the defense of the perimeter, the F-51s had a large share in carrying on with close support and thereby keeping the communists pinned down. The enemy drive had been halted. There were still North Koreans out there in the hills, and we gave them no rest. It was one of the jobs of our versatile air forces to wipe out machine gun nests that in a normal war would have been targets for mortars. Interdiction was stepped up. We staged about 150 such strikes every day and smashed nearly 90% of the supplies the enemy was trying to bring up. His routes were so extended that we had plenty of targets. This was our chance to soften up the whole communist war effort while our ground forces were building up inside the perimeter. The first phase of the war was over. Thanks largely to our air effort, the United Nations was still in there fighting. It was a peculiar war, but the problems were not proving too much for the United States Air Force.
Next, you will see U.S. Air Force F-86 Sabre jets tangle with the Red MiG-15s in the effort to drive communist North Koreans and Chinese troops back to the Yalu River. In the summer of 1950, recruits for the Air Force were arriving at training bases in increasing numbers. There was a mean war on over in Korea. And so far, things weren't going well for our side. The Reds were pushing our ground forces all the way back to the Pusan perimeter. Our air strength was proving the biggest single factor in keeping us from being driven off the peninsula. That air strength had to be kept up and increased. This called for a program of intensive training in all phases of maintenance and operation. Naturally, there was a lot of emphasis on the training of pilots. When the Reds suddenly struck in Korea in June 1950, our problem in logistics was immediate and tremendous. For this was a war on the other side of the biggest of oceans. Supplies for our ground forces as well as our air forces had to be airlifted in huge quantities every day. The Military Air Transport Service under the skilled command of Lieutenant General Lawrence S. Cuter met all requirements efficiently and continuously. The Pacific airlift was a well-oiled engine of supply. The civilian airlines were called on for help and at once turned over 66 transport aircraft and their crews to be used in the airlift. Before long, there were 206 airplanes in operation, including the converted civilian airliners and aircraft of the military air transport service. It was the biggest wartime operation of its kind in history. By September 1950, when the Korean conflict was three months old, the Mats Pacific Airlift was averaging 250,000 airplane miles per day. The Pacific Airlift transports landed their cargoes in Japan in 30 or more flights every day. Here, it was the job of the Combat Cargo Command, organized and commanded by Major General William H. Tunner, to haul men and supplies to the Korean battle zone. While our ground forces were being driven back to the Pusan perimeter, our overall strength was fast building up, and a vital part of that strength was in the more than 100 tons of supplies that Matz was delivering every day. One day late in August of this fateful year of 1950, a C-47 from Japan arrived at the Tegu airfield inside the Pusan perimeter. Our big push to the north was in preparation, and there was to be a conference of top-level commanders representing all three of the armed services. The naval group was headed by Admiral Joy and Vice Admiral Struble, commander of Joint Task Force 7. Our air strength was represented by the commander of the 5th Air Force, Major General Partridge, and by Lieutenant General Stratemeyer, head of the Far East Air Forces with headquarters in Tokyo. Lieutenant General I.H. Edwards, Acting Deputy Chief of Staff, Operations USAF, came from Washington for the conference. In the air action that followed, in the 10 days or so just before the Incheon landing, the workhorses were the B-29s. We had 140 of them ready for business. Their mission was twofold, to neutralize the enemy ground forces that still surrounded the Pusan perimeter in considerable numbers, and to attack all Korean airfields in enemy hands. Our air forces flew more than 3,000 sorties in the week before the Incheon operation. In a huge area around Incheon, the B-29s went after marshalling yards, tunnels, rail lines, anything useful to enemy logistics. 
These Air Force operations left the Reds without any hope of reinforcing or supporting their defenses at Incheon. We were practically unopposed in the air, for we had long since effectively disposed of the Red air strength, which was not going to be troublesome until the MiGs appeared later in the year. There was effective bombing of targets of all descriptions. This was the Air Force's way of helping MacArthur in his magnificent operation at Incheon, which was about to begin. On the morning of 15 September 1950, at Incheon, on Korea's west coast, 150 miles behind the front at the Pusan perimeter, our naval elements went to work to soften up the Red defenses. An unpleasant surprise for the invaders who had taken over nearly the whole peninsula. A 29-foot tide had to be reckoned with in the deployment of the landing craft. General MacArthur witnessed the landing of the 1st Marine Division and the 7th U.S. Infantry Division. The Air Force had done its part by its hammering of the enemy's ground forces, supply lines, and airfields. On the day following the landing at Incheon, the U.N. forces hemmed in for a month at the perimeter around Busan broke through. Up to now, the Reds had done all the advancing. Now, it was our turn. Our ground forces at the perimeter were now formidable. We had four U.S. infantry divisions, seven South Korean divisions, and one British brigade. At the beginning of the war, our ground forces had had a tough time. But now, everything was going as we wanted it to. Our air effort paved the way for this rapid advance. It had completely knocked out enemy aircraft and airfields. Our troops had nothing to fear from red air action. There wasn't much effective opposition of any kind as our forces went on to retake the South Korean capital city of Seoul. There was soon to be a large-scale join-up of our ground forces that landed at Incheon with those that had come up from the Pusan perimeter for the advance to the Yalu River. There was still some scattered resistance from the Reds as our men moved farther to the north. In clearing out enemy rear guard units, our people were getting good cooperation from the South Koreans. After the Incheon landing, aircraft of the Combat Cargo Command came through with a tremendous contribution to the success of the whole campaign. What's going to happen is that C-47s and C-119s will pull off one of the best managed airdrops in combat history. And they're going to do it in enemy territory, about 30 miles north of the captured North Korean capital, Pyongyang. And not only troops, ammunition and food, but jeeps, trucks and howitzers are going to be delivered in this big drop. The first time in combat history for big stuff, as well as paratroopers and their supplies to be delivered by air in the same drop operation. The objective is to trap as many of the retreating enemy as possible and to strengthen our continued advance to the Yalu. Nearly 4,000 paratroopers and their supplies are going to be dropped in the four-day operation along with a great deal of heavy equipment. Exercise Swarmer, held earlier in the year in South Carolina, had been a valuable rehearsal for this operation in Korea. Although at the time, nobody realized that the game was going to be played for keeps so soon.
1 November 1950, enemy air suddenly re-entered the war in a dangerous way. In other words, the Russian-built MiG-15s made their debut in Korea. Our F-80s take on the MiGs. F-86s have been sent for, but in the meantime, the F-80s do all right. It was in an F-80 that Lieutenant Russell Brown shot down the first MiG, the first of many. Cameras mounted on the wings of our fighters automatically photographed the air battle. As fighting aircraft, the F-80s were decidedly inferior to the MiGs, but our old jets were much better handled. The F-80s more than held their own because of the superior skill of our pilots. a little more than a month after the breakthrough at the perimeter and the Incheon landing, virtually all of Korea was in our hands. MacArthur's end of war offensive had gone splendidly. More than 100,000 prisoners were taken by our ground forces in the first five months of the war. A lot of them had frozen feet. It can be mighty cold in the upper reaches of North Korea in late November. Some of our forces got to the Yalu, but this was the terminus of the drive. Policy at the highest level forbade any advance or airstrikes beyond the river. Besides, the Chinese were now in the war. We were faced by a quarter of a million of them. Pretty soon, there was going to be what MacArthur called an entirely new war. The decisive force so far in the Korean conflict was our air power. In spite of the fact that at this time, December 1950, our air force was still suffering from the economy budgets that followed World War II. And in the new war, with a new enemy that was about to begin, our side never lost the supremacy of the air. It was safely in the hands of the United States Air Force. As you will now see, the U.S. Air Force's tactical and logistical air support helped end the conflict, but a stalemate remains in Korea to this day. In late November 1950, after the big push into North Korea by United Nations forces, elements of the 17th U.S. Infantry reached a point on the Yalu River. This, the border of Manchuria, was the objective of MacArthur's End the War campaign. Everything had been going well for our side since the Incheon landing and the breakthrough at the Pusan perimeter in mid-September. And then something happened. The Chinese came into the war. Suddenly, the effective enemy strength increased about 300%. The word came that all United Nations ground forces were to withdraw southward. As General MacArthur put it, this was an entirely new war. By now, we are opposed by great masses of Chinese troops and were greatly outnumbered. A rapid retreat to the south had to be made in the face of this massive threat. The enemy push was about to carry him all the way to below Seoul in South Korea. His second big attempt to push us off the peninsula. The C-119s operating from a Shia air base in southern Japan airdropped supplies to our withdrawing ground forces. Operations possible only because our air forces maintained air superiority. All through this period of retreat, the boxcars dropped much needed ammunition, food and medical supplies, as well as heavy stuff such as vehicles and artillery pieces. When our ground forces were compelled to pull back, 
the United Nations air power became the only means of effectively opposing the advance of the formidable Chinese army. This was the last week of November 1950 and the first half of December. The F-80s went up and hit the enemy close to our line. And there were also a great many interdiction and reconnaissance missions. It was our air strength again, as it was at the beginning of the conflict six months before, that prevented the envelopment of our withdrawing ground forces. The enemy was slowed down because we inflicted a tremendous number of casualties among his personnel, and because we kept on hitting his increasingly extended supply lines. This went on until in mid-December 1950. We were able to stabilize a line near the 38th parallel. In one month, our air forces flew more than 11,000 combat sorties. At this time, the middle of December 1950, our F-86s went into action against the MiGs. And now began one of the brightest chapters in the story of our air forces in the Korean conflict. Here we are in the pilot briefing room of an F-86 squadron. Oh, fire sweep a day. In this area right here. We'll start engines as I indicated on, on the board. Here's the plan. Tiger flight, you'll take off up to this area here. Right out to here, where you'll make a right turn, come back. 30 miles inland, look back in. Eagle flight, you'll follow Tiger. You'll come out this area here. Up to this point here where you make a left turn, look back in. The last two flights, Wolf and Robin, will take off and come up to the center. This point here, where they'll cut right up in to the uh, Yellow River, cutting short of the Yellow, where they'll split, one doing a right turn, and Wolf will make a, a left turn. Now, uh, the first four flights in the area will stay below the contrails and keep a uh, close watch on the fighter bombers. The last two flights will go above the contrails and check very closely for any MiG aircraft that might come in above the cons. Now, if you see MiGs up there today, call them out. Give their altitude, direction, and geographical location on the, on the map and call it out and get off the radio. Now remember, once you look around, keep your speed up, and if you do get a bounce, cut him off, and drive in, in range. When you get in range, shoot, and when you shoot, shoot the kill. Anybody got any questions? Okay, let's go get him. for MiG Alley, that wide band of airspace over northwest Korea infested by the enemy jets. had this great advantage over the Russian-built MiGs. They were better handled. Simply as aircraft, the MiGs were at least the equal of the F-86s, and the enemy had a lot of them. They usually outnumbered the F-86s, sometimes by as much as three or four to one. But our pilots were much more skillful than theirs. This was the big reason that we destroyed eight times as many of their fighters as they did of ours. During the entire war, 827 MiGs were down. We lost 112 jet aircraft in air-to-air -air combat.
January 1951, the United Nations ground forces mounted a counterattack from the line of their furthest withdrawal. They pounded their way from below the 38th parallel and through the Iron Triangle. By June, the Reds were ready for an armistice. The battle line of mid-June was to remain more or less stabilized throughout the coming peace talks. In this building at Kaesong, the truce negotiations began in July 1951. A couple of weeks previously, the Russian delegate to the United Nations had made it clear that the Reds had had enough. General Nam Il of the North Korean army was the spokesman for the enemy. The United Nations delegation was headed by Vice Admiral Joy of the United States Navy and included Major General Craigie of the Air Force, General Pike Sun Yup of the South Korean Army, and Rear Admiral Burke. After a year of fighting, there now began two years of talk. But during all that time, air assaults on the enemy were going to continue. After 21 months of dispute, chiefly over the problem of prisoners, an agreement was reached, at least on the exchange of sick and wounded. In April 1953, Operation Little Switch began. To Panmunjom, communist ambulances brought, at the rate of 100 a day, about 600 United Nations prisoners. Little Switch, this operation, was followed some months later by Big Switch, the large-scale exchange of the rest of the prisoners. Shortly after Little Switch got underway, the Reds were eager to resume the armistice talks, which had been suspended by the exasperated United Nations delegation the preceding autumn. All through the nearly two years of wrangling at Kaesong, our air forces had been hammering away at the enemy ground forces and communications and airfields and transport. The communists were ready to quit. So at Panmunjom on 27 July 1953, the Korean conflict ends, not in a peace, but in a ceasefire, an armed truce. Lieutenant General William K. Harrison, chief negotiator for the United Nations, signs the agreement, followed by General Nam Il for the North Koreans. So ended a mean war. But for the first time, communist designs in the free world had been stopped by military force. This was something that had to be done. And in its achievement, a large share of the credit belongs to the United States Air Force. The success of our jet pilots stands forth boldly in the records. 39 of them became aces in the Korean conflict. Each of the 39 destroyed five or more enemy MiGs. To name only a few, Lieutenant Colonel George A. Davis, Jr., 14 MiGs destroyed. Captain Joseph McConnell, Jr., 16 kills. Colonel Royal N. Baker, 13 MiGs downed. Captain Harold Fisher, Jr., 10 destroyed. Major Manuel J. Fernandez, 14 and a half kills. Colonel Francis S. Gabreski, 6 and a half, on top of his 31 kills over Germany. Major James Jibara, 1st Korean ace, 15 enemy jets destroyed. Colonel Harrison Thing, 5 MiGs downed. Captain Ivan C. Kinchelow, 5 kills. Colonel James K. Johnson, 10 MiGs destroyed. To our 39 Korean aces, indeed to all of our pilots who took part in the air battle, go praise and honor from us all. Splendidly, they upheld the national cause and the highest standards of the United States Air Force. We have come to the end of another chapter in our video history of air combat. I look forward to joining you again for our next exciting presentation in this series.